This is an excerpt from my book, Bricklin on Technology. This is from Chapter 2, What Will People Pay For? In 2000, the press seemed to be ignoring the mundane use of cell phones. It seemed like they were concentrating on the phone moving to a commerce platform. This fit with the view that what regular people wrote or said was of little interest unless it involved making money. This view was also applied to blogging and other uses of the Internet. My observations, though, brought me to write this essay. July 11, 2000. What will people pay for? Regular people are willing to pay money to interact with people they care about. You keep reading stories about how cell phones will be used for checking stock quotes and making trades, buying stuff, and other e-commerce. It seems business plans are based on people paying for such stuff. I think that e-commerce is not where things will go. If you look at normal people's use of the Internet, cell phones, and other communications technologies that they pay for, they are not driven by wanting to buy things or track their money. Unlike the kings and children's rhymes, most people don't sit in their counting houses counting out their money. Most people don't buy and sock, sell stock so frequently and on such whim that they need to do it on a cell phone. Oh, look, that trendy kid over there is wearing penny loafers. Quick, I must buy stock in a penny loafer company before it goes up this afternoon. Most people don't buy and sell many stocks at all. Some people do, but not this huge majority that will drive the wireless Internet revolution. Look at how regular people use cell phones, especially if the cost is low like it is in many countries outside the USA. Listen to cab drivers with their own cell phones, bus drivers, mothers, kids, etc. They mainly talk to their friends and loved ones for very personal, mundane things. I finally left the office, but traffic is late. Yes, I can pick up a pizza on the way home. I've got a free minute and thought I'd say hi. Did you find it yet? Where are you? No, I didn't do it. I thought you were going to do it. Well, tell him Daddy says no, too. What's up? Want to do something tonight? Etc. Look at what people do when they go to an internet cafe when traveling and don't have their own access to the internet. You don't find them surfing to buy things. They pay money to access their email to stay in touch with friends and loved ones. A huge percentage of AOL usage is instant messaging. They pay to say hi, flirt, chit-chat about their day, etc., especially with their buddies. Also, people like interacting by giving little gifts to each other, saying, I remembered you and and uh, what you might like. They send postcards, mainly the paper kind, but also the e-kind. They spend a large amount of their valuable vacation time buying I Remembered You gifts. They love spending money on friends and loved ones at special times like Christmas. It's better to give than to receive. They forward jokes they've heard and read to people they care about. People like to interact with people they care about. The interactions are often simple but personally important. They are willing to pay money for this. That's why they pay for cell phones, for internet access, for postcards and postage, and for souvenirs. It gives them emotional satisfaction. They pay money to travel to visit family and friends. And then a footnote. A few months before this essay was written, an extremely popular and later award-winning TV commercial was first aired. It was the Budweiser Was Up ad in their True series. It showed a bunch of friends calling each other on the phone and intercom, basically saying, What's up? What you doing? Watching the game, having a bud. That's about the extent of their conversation. While this may seem silly to many, to me it really was the key to what I write about here. Mundane interactions, but personal with in-jokes and part of an ongoing relationship with the person, are very much a part of being human and are what we pay for. They matter to us. If you think the guys in the ad aren't like you, you may be missing a driving force in the market. I get an image in my head when I see people on the street having these simple interactions on the phone. It's the image of primates sitting next to each other grooming one another. Simple, kind interactions with ones close to us are innate. People also pay money for other forms of emotional satisfaction that aren't through other people directly. Listening to music, watching movies, seeing something beautiful or interesting. Buying isn't fun. Shopping is. Shopping is looking at things and imagining owning them or wearing them or using them. Shopping is looking for just the right thing out of many possibilities. Shopping is often around or with other people. People pay money to shop in interesting places, even if they don't buy much. For instance, they travel to New York City to walk down Fifth Avenue and look in at Tiffany's, Steuben Glass until they moved, and FAO Schwartz. They go to Italy to look at the stores with the designer clothes. So people will pay money for things that give them emotional satisfaction, especially those things that involve interacting with others or have a high emotional content like music. A follow-up from May 10, 2001. 
I found an interesting article that is well-researched and shows how communication, especially for social reasons, commands more money than professionally produced content. Content is Not King by Andrew Odalisco of AT&T Labs appeared in First Monday, an example from the introduction. Content certainly has all the glamour. What content does not have is money. The annual movie ticket, theater ticket sales in the U.S. are well under $10 billion. The telephone industry collects that much money every two weeks. Those commodity pipelines attract much more spending than the glamorous content. And um, that's the end of that um, uh, essay. And then it says, a personal example. Cell phones have moved from playing a minor role in our interpersonal relationships to being internalized by many people as an integral part of maintaining those relationships. Here is a related blog post I wrote the following year. This is from Wednesday, November 6, 2002, with my dad and the cell phone as a lifeline. I was visiting my dad in the nursing home yesterday. I took him over to the auditorium to hear Cantor Louise Treitman sing some Hebrew songs. As we sat there, she announced her next, next song, the old pioneer farmer song, Shir Haimek. It's the song I still remember my dad singing to my sister and me as a lullaby when I was four and younger. My dad perked up, and the two of us sang along while I held his hand, probably two of a very few out of the 125 people in the room to do so, since the song is not well known today. My eyes were filled with, te- with tears, memories of a long time ago. I wanted to share the moment somehow. Holding his hand was one way, but what about my sister? I didn't have my camera with me, so I couldn't use its sound record function. I pulled out my cell phone and hit her name on speed dial, hoping to put some of the sound on her answering machine. But unfortunately, it had problems connecting, the problems with cell phones. And I was too busy singing to pay attention. I waited until the night to call her and tell her about it. That moment with the cell phone brought up another image I saw earlier in the day. A woman getting out of the driver's seat in her car and opening up the back door to take her small child out of a car seat while still clutching an object in her hand that she obviously felt was important, her cell phone. I remember thinking, more and more I see people clutching their cell phones as a major source of comfort or something. It's like they are holding onto a railing when they walk downstairs. The cell phone gives them some sense of security. I feel that it represents a lifeline to the rest of our circle of important people, and we treat it as such. It's a space warp that connects us to others we need to go through life. It's today, in today's complicated world, we can juggle our disconnected lives and make them connected by using technology like cell phones, email, IM, and digital cameras. I may be very busy and never be sure where I'll be at any given time, but that doesn't affect my being able to coordinate with others. I'm on my way, and it looks like I'll get uh, to the building around 8 p.m. When I get there, I'll call you on your cell phone, and we'll figure out how, where to meet. With all the talk about commerce and advertising, I still think that friend-to-friend relationships are a major driving force in our adoption of and paying for much of new technology. If you haven't read it, read it, you should take a look at my What Will People Pay For essay that I just read. In my recording industry essay, which appears in Chapter 3, I also point out how the huge increases in use of cell phones may explain some of the drop in music sales. Increasingly, you see people walking or standing with cell phones pressed to their ears instead of wearing earphones from personal music systems. With email, you can imagine how unlikely it would have been 10 years ago to think that email would be so important that spam would be a problem that mattered to regular people. For more information about the book, you can go to my website, www.bricklin.com.